Hi. I'm introducing our next panel, which is called Planning Best Practices. It's one of our favorites. The o overarching theme of this is that you know, Remix has work, is working with over 225 agencies, and we've learned a lot about planning and implementing transit from you all. But uh, we want to share those best practices, whether it's everyday use cases, whether it's big projects like a COA. And so we have an all-star all -star panel today um, from representing three different transit agencies that are going to share their planning best practices inside and outside of Remix. So Stephen Hunt is going to be our first presenter. He is the principal planner over at Valley Regional Transit, the VRT, in Boise, Idaho. Uh, he's been working in the transit agency for 15 years, and he spent nine of those years at King County Metro in the Seattle region where he helped implement their long-range transit plan. And if anyone knows anything about the Seattle region, we've been talking about a bit, bit about Seattle today, they have a lot of jurisdictions. So there's a lot of cat herding that was involved with that project. So please welcome Stephen to the stage. Thank you, glad to be here. I maybe need to explain the, the title of my slide or the slideshow today, Freedom 575. So when I was first uh, working at, at uh, King County, I developed a little bit of a reputation for writing haikus. And haikus are a, they're a Japanese poetry form, they're all about syllables, five syllable, seven syllable, five syllable. I like it because it's really short. Um, it doesn't have to rhyme, and, and, and so I, I just like this kind of the simplicity of the haiku format. So I would write these, po these haikus sometimes about work-related things, so maybe about bridges or about traffic. Um, let's see, I guess I need to go there. I, and, um, and so, but they were all, I mean, they were terrible little haikus. <laughs> But um, I was re-inspired by about using poetry, or, and uh, when in work settings, when I was listening to Jarrett Walker give a talk, uh, who's a transportation consultant, and he framed the he framed the problem of transit as a problem of freedom, and so that was an inspiring thing to me to think about how can we write about um, transit from the pers from a freedom frame. So what I want to share with you today are some thoughts about how to how to do that and how that can influence your relationship both with your MPO, so if, you, if you're not the MPO yourselves, how it can influence your relationship with other planning bodies and the, and the public. So um, the first thing that I want to do is, so you, you'll, you'll have the pleasure of reading a few haikus that I put together for this presentation. <laughs> I'm not going to read them because I'm a professional, not a beatnik. But, um, <laughs> but what I, what I do want to encourage you first to do is actually to think about, and, and it doesn't have to be a haiku, but find a way to express um, your feeling of transit and its relationship to freedom. And the reason that I feel like that's an important thing to do is because it's, it's, the, it's the motivational well that I go back to when uh, things get hard, when a project gets, when you get a lot of resistance to a particular project maybe, um, public meeting doesn't go well, or more discouragingly, maybe when other planners disparage the, the relevance of transit and what it can do. Being able to describe your, have a professional foundation around something as universally attractive um, and accepted as freedom is extremely useful to me personally, but it also, I think, as we'll get into, um, makes a really strong kind of communication foundation platform for how to talk to the rest of the rest of the writing public. So um, the first, that's, is that right? There we go. Uh, the first step to writing your haiku is you, you got to believe, actually, that transit can deliver on personal freedom. And this, this may not be a, a, an intuitively obvious thing about transit. It wasn't immediately to me. So I want to share this, this really brief story about how that first came to light um, in my mind. So there is a, a youth-focused youth pro bicycle program in Seattle called the Major Taylor Project. And its purpose is to empower individuals in disadvantaged communities to build healthy relationships uh, and lifestyles and 
most importantly to me, it's about helping them have the confidence to explore their community. And what was amazing to me as I heard about this program was the stories that they would tell about how these, how these youth would feel trapped living in, in their neighborhood that was dangerous, um, that didn't have the opportunities that they wanted, uh, that, was, that was disinvested, how they felt trapped by, by their own neighborhood. And the way that their whole future opened up when they realized that by learning how to maintain and use a bicycle that they, that they could leave their, leave their neighborhood at their own will and under their own power was a super important thing to them. It made them free to engage in the community around them. And that, to me, resonated and I thought that, that is powerful. Um, and I think it's something that we as transit professionals need to become much more aggressive and intentional about communicating. That, that what we do in transit, because what transit, what good transit can do, is it can do the same thing. Good transit that allows you to be able to, to travel when you want to, to get to the places that you want to, allows people to live the lives that they, to live a, a freer life. And I believe that, that we as transit professionals need to become much more intentional about telling that particular story. Not the least reason for which, because people, people will pay for their freedom, right? We'll get into more of that later. So the, the second step to, to making this work is haikus generally aren't going to make it into long-range transportation plans. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we, what we have to be able to do is learn how to quantify your haiku. Uh, and the tools that we've used in the past typically don't tell this story of freedom particularly well. In, in Seattle, the experience that, that, we had was, that I had was uh, we got good at telling how much transit we needed and how much that transit would cost and what the ridership forecast would be. But when we put all those things together, what that meant our compelling story was, was that if we didn't get this money, then traffic's gonna be worse and we may not develop the way that we had originally planned. So our most compelling story was a threat to the public. It was like, do this or else. Um, and I, I just think that's, that's not our, our strongest story. Um, and, and, shoot, one more little bit on that. The other thing that, that, we, did, that we didn't do um, in that long range, the original long range plan, not the original, but the one that was in place uh, when I showed up in, in Seattle was we only talked about percentage, percent change in um, the underlying transit network. We, we broke, the, broke it up into core and, and other types of transit network, but all we did was just apply, you know, we're gonna grow frequencies by 2% 2, 2 a year or something like that, right? Over those 25 years. We didn't look at the underlying network. We didn't talk about restructuring the network. We just laid on new projects that we knew about, so like light rail expansions and things like that. Those just went on top of the network, and that was the extent of the modeling work that went into it. So not, not particularly useful for tying back to this frame about freedom. Um, in Boise, where I work now, it's, it's an entirely different story. Uh, we're mostly fighting just for relevance. Um, but still, the point that I want to make is when we do talk about, when we do try and quantify things, what we're quantifying is, what the current plan quantifies is the change in ridership and the, um, they have a transit LOS on corridors. So when we're talking about where we need to be in the future, in 25 years, growing ridership by almost 80% is not a particularly compelling story, particularly when you're starting at only a million boardings a year. So, let me talk, so what did we do? What did we do to address that? In Seattle, what we'd worked on was, uh, we, we had to start with the network. Um, it became obvious to me when working with the MPO that what we needed to be able to do is we needed to be able to describe to the MPO where our transit service would be in 25 years. We had to do that. And the reason you have to do that is because the freedom that transit provides, which we can illustrate on the left, the freedom that that transit provides is entirely dictated by the shape of your network. Um, and so you can't actually tell this story about freedom without having to put the time into developing what that network looks like. So the first thing that we did was we said, we need to do some strong network planning. And that's awesome, because when you start talking about network planning, what you're talking about is why this route here, why that route there. And if, if you have the overarching goal, or I would say the overarching goal of any uh, network planning has to be 
getting more people to more places more often. Why? So that they can do more things. And that, that ties directly back to, your, to this concept about what you're doing is you are enhancing uh, public freedom. So we were very fortunate to be able to, to have the analytical tools to, be able, uh, to guide our network planning through the use of accessibility analysis. So in addition to um, being able to look at the network and redesign the network, we were able to get information back out of that about how many people and how many jobs are accessible in, in 30, 45, 60 minutes for the entire region. Um, and that was, that was groundbreaking. And it, it really changed the way we were able to talk to the communities that we were serving. Uh, when we said, Redmond, we're going to not run service directly downtown anymore. You're, and we know you're interested in making that downtown connection. But here we can show you that you can still get downtown in a reasonable amount of time and look at all these other places that you can get to, right? So that was, that was in, in, uh, really helpful for both communicating what we were trying to do and guiding the development of that network. As I was talking earlier, you get two planners in a room and you can try and figure out what should you do. I'm sure this happens everywhere. You're going to have different ideas. And so what guides that? What guides the development of that network? And if you have something as overarching as this idea of more people, more places, more often, which is freedom, then um, it's super helpful. So in Boise, uh, again, it's a fight for relevance. We're, we're just trying to say, look, we're important. Um, and being able to frame that, though, in terms of freedom really is helpful because the current, the current modeling, which is based on a, an extremely anemic system, when, when you try and apply those model forecasts into the future, you get still really bad ridership, even though it's a huge increase in, in cost. And so when we're talking about this cost-benefit ratio, uh, we, need a different, we need a different metric and something that allows us to measure directly the value that tran the transit brings to a community um, and doesn't require your transportation modelers to, to change their assumptions because there's, there's well, because they won't. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's good for them not to, right? I mean, because there has to be reasons for it. And, and we, it's based, there's those, all those calibrations are based on existing observed behavior. The problem for us is when we've got a system that just runs from seven to seven, five days a week on an hourly headway, you, you put all those, those coefficients into the future and you say, yeah, ramp it up five times and you get ridership that grows only 80%. And so trying to make an argument about why that's cost effective is extremely difficult. But being able to turn that around and say, well, I don't know what the ridership is going to be, but I can tell you what the accessibility change is. And, I, and that is, the reason that that also is be, uh, helpful is because not only do you have now an objective tool, you also have a motivational story, right? You have a story that says, here, on the top slide there, that's a new development in Meridian that has no transit service to it at all. You can't get anywhere, and everybody kind of knows that. But you look at what transit can do, and you can, so, you can show that with investment, it can become a central hub to the entire Treasure Valley and connect all these different places. And that's a story that people can understand immediately. So I call this slide my pot of gold slide. So, you can see maybe just a little bit in the corner there, there's a slight rainbow. This is um, Boise in the middle of the Treasure Valley. And it, the reason that I call this the pot of gold slide, not only because there's a rainbow, is because when we frame transit as this, the, the purpose of it is about expanding personal mobility, sorry, freedom, um, we, we can expand that to be a much more universal story. And today, people pay for their freedom. When we look at um, the amount that people pay just in operating, operating their own vehicles, so this is the operation cost of driving, a, of all the people in the Treasure Valley driving their cars, the gas, insurance, uh, repairs, all those things, not the capital cost of buying the car, but just the operating cost, they spend about $1.5 billion to travel around, $1.5 billion. And we spend 1% of that on transit. So 15 million is our operating budget in the Treasure Valley. And this is, to me, a really interesting slide because it does two things. It, it first explains why transit is so terrible in, um, in the Treasure Valley, and it also explains what's possible. Because we're talking about increasing transit five, six-fold just to get to where we are, just to be comparable with our peers. And people are going to ask, where is that money coming from? That money is coming from money that we're already spending, that people are already spending on transportation. Um, 
And you can't expect to have $1.5 billion worth of freedom for only $15 million worth of investment. So it, it just provides you a way to, and, and the other thing that's important about that is that means this story has to be a universal story about freedom, right? It has, it has to be, we're interested in getting as many different people. I don't care what your background is, where you're going, why you're going. I just want to help you get from where you are today to where you want to be um, in 30 minutes, right? And so um, that's, that to me is really powerful, particularly for a location that can't rely on its existing service as a justification for its existence um, or existing use. And how do you grow out of how do you grow out of that? So takeaways. Oh, they didn't show up. I'll leave up to you to tell me what the takeaways are. <laughs> um, but they are first. We got to be more intentional about using the freedom as a story for what transit is about. Second, we have to focus on network planning. That's got to be a core piece of what we do as transit planners is defining what that network looks like because that network defines the freedom that transit brings to a specific location. Third, you have to be able to model that network. You have to be able to model it because you need those, that kind of objective uh, reasoning for what, what you're about. And fourth, use accessibility as your measure because it's, it is the, the measure that most closely correlates with your message of freedom, right? Ridership, who cares, really? Uh, but if you're able to show how many people and where this location can be connected to, now you're talking about something that somebody can relate to, like, oh, well, I live there and my job's there. That works for me, right? Um, and it, and uh, it, that shows more about what's possible rather than what, what is right now. And so now you can enter into whole lots of interesting conversations about how you prioritize roadways, all those kinds of things, when you're able to show this is what's possible with the network that we have. So I want to leave with another haiku a final haiku, um, and really, I don't want to disparage uh, models. There, I, I respect the the mathematical rigor of what goes into a model, and in fact, accessibility analysis is another model. But what I, I want us to walk away with is that when we talk about um, freedom, then expanding our personal freedom, I think, is a much how do I, dang it. Expanding personal free, our personal freedoms can be a much brighter future than what a model, a ridership model, is going to forecast for us. And, and that's the point. We, and we have to find a way to, to make that, turn that corner and be able to tell why transit matters. So thank you. <laughs>